Well, it's really great to be here today, and I uh, just want to start off. Um, somebody gave me this. I don't know who gave it to me, but um, a college student was a, a, in a philosophy class which had a discussion about God's existence. The uh, professor presented the following logic. Has anybody in class heard God? Nobody spoke. Has anybody in class Touch God. Again, nobody spoke. Has anybody in class seen God? And nobody spoke for the third time. He simply stated, then there's no God. One student thought for a second and then asked permission to reply, curiously to hear what this bold student response was going to be. The professor granted it. And the student stood up and asked the following questions of his classmates. Has anybody in class heard our professor's brain? Has anybody in class, class touched our professor's brain? Absolute silence. Has anyone in class seen our professor's brain? Nobody in class dared to speak. The student concluded, then according to our professor's logic, it must be true that our professor has no brain. The student received an A. <laughs> you know, it's, it's amazing. We live in, a, in an amazing time, I believe, in, uh, in God's plan and God's kingdom. And I, I just see the, the church itself being rattled. I see so many things happening uh, in the natural there's things that are going on that, that boggle our minds. We, sometimes we don't know whether we're coming or going. We don't know what's up, what's down. One minute they tell us eggs are great for you, the next minute we tell, they tell us they're poison. Uh, cheese or goodness knows what, all these things. So everybody's got logic and everybody's got opinions. But there's only one thing that's going to remain, and that's the Word of God, isn't it? There's one thing that whatever God says, and that's where it's all about. So Father, today I pray that you'll give me the ability to be able to share what you put on my heart today. My God, I pray that we'll be able to push through and, and push aside things that aren't so important. Father, today at communion, we heard that there are so many things that, that even though we love God, there are things that we still hang on to. There's things there that, that Lord, we don't really put our trust in you fully. We, we're still trying to do it ourselves. And and Lord, we know that, 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 Lord, that's natural man, but God, you want us to come out of that and you want us to be totally dependent upon you. You don't want us to be silly, you don't want us to be stupid, but Lord, you want us to live by faith. And for that, Lord, I pray that you'll help us understand and we'll give you all the praise, we'll give you all the glory. And everybody said, Amen. I'm going to go over some things because over the last month or so, we've been sharing things and and to me, it's been a challenge to my own life. And, uh, and so today, I want to just go over some things. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing. Amen? The word what God spoke. See, in Genesis 1.26, uh, God gave man dominion. How many people believe that God gave man dominion? He gave man dominion over the fish, over the birds, over the cattle, over the earth and over everything that creeps on the earth. God created man with authority, with power. He was created in God's image. He carried a mantle. He carried an anointing. He carried the victory. He carried everything that God represented. God had a plan. He came to, to create a human race. He wanted a people that, that would know Him people that he could know, a people that he could dwell among, a people that he could fellowship with, the people that he, in, in a sense, he wanted to, he, he had a plan for, for humanity to live on this planet, to live on this earth or wherever it might be. But unfortunately, there was another created being, Satan and his fallen angels. I believe that God created Adam and Eve or they already had authority over the devil. They already had power over the devil. 
The enemy had to come and deceive. And I believe today the church, so the authority that God's given to the church, what the enemy tries to do is he comes to deceive. He comes to rob. He comes to distort. He comes to take away the power out of something until you've just left with a skeleton. God's created being Adam and Eve already had dominion over Satan and the fallen angels. I believe all, he needed, all they needed to do was resist. Satan had to deceive them to gain control. You see, the enemy wanted something so desperately. He knew that he was stripped. He knew that, that his place, and, and he did have power. He did have, he did have everything that pertains and everything that he needed. But something happened. He fell. He was separated and he lost something. And he saw that Adam and Eve had this something that he wanted. You know, today the church has got something that the devil wants. And he'll do whatever he can to steal it from us. Jesus was very, very conscious when he said, and it wasn't just idle words. It wasn't just something that he thought, I'll just add this in. He said that there's an enemy that comes to rob, to kill, and to destroy. That's what the enemy's plan is, to rob, to kill, and to destroy. But he said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So I, I believe that that's what's going on today. You see, Jesus comes on the scene after a lot of things have happened to win back what was stolen at the fall. And Jesus made some amazing statements that we, the church, sometimes just speak and say, but they don't have the impact. They don't have the power. And, 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 I, and I really believe that the Spirit of God wants to come again and and words that, that are spoken through Jesus Christ all of a sudden would, would hit us and, and, and cause us to stand and, and put backbone on the inside of us that, that we wouldn't be a jellyfish, that we wouldn't be people that are just being tossed around by every wind of doctrine. We wouldn't be a people that are, that are just being pushed here and there and, and the enemy's got us sort of where, where he wants us. But I, I believe that we're a people that God wants to restore again. And, and so is that when the Word of God comes, it, it comes with power, it comes with authority, and, and it gets on the inside of us and causes something on the inside of us to start to stand. Because you see, I believe that if we don't stand, we'll get run over. I do honestly believe that. So when Jesus came to, to restore what was stolen at the fall, we know that, that the, the story, you know it so well. I'm, I don't want to go into that story where, where Adam and Eve, what they did, they partook of the fruit and so forth, and, and they were separated and they were pushed out. And, and we know that, that, you know, mess just came upon humanity. But Jesus came for a purpose. He came to destroy the works of Satan. He came to win back for humanity what Satan had stolen from us. And so, so when he came and he, and he started to speak and he, he would stand. And, and, you know, sometimes, you know, people may not really understand. You and I may not understand, but I want to tell you the devil understands. I want to tell you in the realm of the Spirit, they understand. And they hear things that perhaps the church isn't hearing at the moment. But when Jesus stood there that day and he said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I'm going to give my church the keys of the kingdom. And whatever they bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever they loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And I want to tell you, that would have shocked the devil to his back teeth as those words would have resonated in the devil's head, as it would have been clanging and banging, and, and as Jesus stood, because you see those words that Jesus spoke had authority, they had power. And I want to tell you, this is something that I believe the church, we have to find out. It says that, that the devil will not prevail over us. It will not be victorious over us. He will not rule over us. He won't reign over us, but we will rule over him. Do you believe that today? Luke 4, 18, Jesus again, as the devil attempted him and did everything he could to try to stop him try to get him off course, try to do something his way and not God's way. I believe one of the greatest tragedies today is the church is not really doing it God's way. We're doing it logic way. 
Logic has no brain. <laughs> Remember that little story. And Jesus stood there that day and he opened up the book and he began to read. And he started to say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and God has anointed me. And I want to say, friends, that the church, we've got to not just have little nursery rhymes. We don't just have to have a little memory verse. It's not just something that you put on your fridge. But when we understand we the church, the church, the church triumphant, the church victorious, ruling and reigning with Jesus, that as Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, that we too this morning can stand up and speak it with authority and say the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed us. Amen. We are anointed. We are anointed. We are anointed to break strongholds, to smash down and do different things. Again, I believe that, that the enemy would have just hear, heard these words. But do we, the church, hear them? Did that day when Jesus stood up and he spoke those words, was it going over the head of the congregation that he was speaking to? Was it going over their head? But I want to tell you the spirit world was aware of it. The spirit world is very aware that God is going to raise up his church. You know, this, uh, I think it's the Bolt Report, the guy there that does the Bolt Report. He's not a Christian, but he's an observer, and he's watching, and he's seeing the, the world system and things like that. And he's talking, and he spoke about the Christians, and he said, what are the Christians doing? And the Christians are sitting back just allowing the enemy to run all over us. Does it go over our head? Does it go over our thinking? Does it go beyond our, our natural ability? So we say it is impossible. What are we saying? Or are we starting to come into agreement with God's word that says the spirit of the Lord is upon us? That God said through Jesus Christ, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Do you realize this morning that if we could stand up in unity, if we could stand up in total agreement, cleanse our minds of unbelief and hardness of heart or whatever it might be, and stand with Jesus Christ and declare it, believing it, I want to tell you there's no force on earth, there's no devil in hell, there's no demonic power that will be able to stand before you, there is no sickness, there is no disease, there's nothing. Jesus walked up to a coffin and he told the guy to get out. He walked up to blind eyes and he said, eyes open. He walked up to different circumstances and he spoke because he said, these things that I do, you can do also. He walked on water. He spoke to the wind and the sea. Why? Because he had unadulterated faith in what God said. We, the church, sit back with mixture in our mind and in our thinking. We don't know whether we're up or down. We don't know whether we're coming or going. Something's got to change. Is it okay to talk like this? It doesn't sound like it from you people. <laughs> Can I hear an amen? amen? How many people want to be part of this? How many people want to be involved in what God's doing? Bible says in Acts 1.8, and you, everybody put your hand on your head. <laughs> You're talking to the person you got your hand on. <laughs> and you shall receive power. Who? You. <laughs> oh, you mean David? <laughs> you mean this one? You mean the disciples? No, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. You shall receive power. you got more power in you, I want to tell you, than you could ever imagine. If we just started to activate it and motivate it and, and start to use it the way God wants to use it, can I say this? There's not one of us here in the church that doesn't need to step up, me included. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. In Luke 10, 19, it says, I give you authority. Do you know today that you have authority? Oh, not me. <laughs> no, you have authority to tread on serpents, Scorpions, that's all that's the spirit world. That's that's the that's the world out there. There's a world out there, spirit world that, that messes with humanity, messes with the church. 
that comes against us and says, and I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over some of the works of the devil. <laughs> and over all the works of Satan. What an amazing word all is. And over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus made this statement. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. I want to read some scriptures that I've read to you many times. It's found in Philippians. Philippians, and, and we've got to... I have to. I have to. I have to. I don't know about you, but I have to. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay. Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How many people know that the Bible says we have the mind of Christ? But let this mind be in you. What, what does that really mean? Let this thinking your mind is what thinks. Sometimes it thinks stinking. Sometimes it thinks negative. But let this mind be in you, the same mind which was in Jesus Christ, who being the form of God did, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name, which, above every, uh, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow on heaven and on earth and those under the earth that every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you believe that today? Have this mind. Let this mind, if ever, you know, we, we need to have our minds renewed. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is, what, what does it say? Which is holy and acceptable to you. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our mind can go natural and in the flesh and, and in logic and in all that sort of stuff. But friend, we have to have a spiritual mind. We've got to have our minds that have been programmed by the Spirit of God. When God says yes, it means yes. When He says no, He means no. I believe the church was birthed in power. On the day of Pentecost, it was birthed in power in Genesis, right in the very beginning. Adam and Eve, Adam, I give you authority. I give you dominion to rule, to reign. I give you that authority. The devil hated that. I believe the church was birthed in power in Genesis. Can you imagine it? Can you imagine that creation? Let there be light. <sighs> Let us create man in our own image, in our own likeness, formed a man out of the dust of the earth. But he did something dynamic and so powerful, he breathed into him the breath of life. He breathed into Adam the breath of life. At Pentecost, he came as a mighty rushing wind and he breathed into them as they sat, as they prayed, as they sought God. He breathed into them the breath of life. He breathed into them the power of God. What an amazing statement. See, God, I believe, 
has always had a plan for man from Genesis to Revelation. I believe his plan has never changed. If we do not, don't see God's plan, man's plan will come into being. Man will try to do it his own way. It's very interesting about those guys being baptized that they still wanted to hold their sword. Very interesting. I believe the Father wants to pour out His Spirit again so that Jesus may be glorified. Not just so for you and me, but so Jesus may be glorified. How many people know that that's God's plan, to glorify His Son? I believe that Jesus must hold a position of honor. We must honor and exalt Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit always honors, always honors Jesus Christ and His precious blood. For God to restore His power, His plan, we the church, we the church, you and I must, I believe, have a revelation of the cross of Calvary. The cross speaks to us of the cost and the suffering of Christ. We have communion every Sunday. And sometimes when we have communion and different ones come up, and, you know, it can be difficult. What can I say? He said that last week. They said it the week before. Somebody else said it over there. Friend, I don't care whether we say the same verse every week. It's got nothing to do with saying. It's, doing, it's, it's all in the remembering of what he did for me. We can't make it something else. It, it's, we can't try to take that away and, and talk about something else and, and then just have the communion. I want to tell you, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. But he didn't say just do it. He said, do this as oft as you can, as often as you can. And friend, when we get around this communion, we've got to remember, we've got to remember, we've got to remember and remember and remember the suffering, what Jesus did, how he, how the price he paid. I heard somebody speaking the other day about the communion, and he was talking about when Jesus hung on that cross, and we try to put a little cloth over him, everything like that, but he hung there totally naked, totally naked. Embarrassing, yes, and all that, but, but you know, that goes on. I can't imagine it. But he, he, he did it for you and me. He suffered, he paid the price. He, he allowed them to scourge him. He allowed them to spit upon him. He allowed them to abuse him. He allowed them to pluck his beard. He let them, he let them just make a mockery out of him. He did it for you and me. We've got for us to, to really rise up, for us even to be, start to get ready to pay the price. Uh, over the last few weeks, we've been speaking a little bit about taking up your cross and following him. Let a man deny himself, all these sort of things. But the church has lost that, that, that whole segment of, of Christianity. It's now, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. Air conditioning, I've got to have air conditioning, I've got to have good seat, I've got to have this, I've got to have that, I've got to have all these things so I'm comfortable. Well, just have a look at Jesus for a few minutes and see how comfortable he was on the cross. And you know what he was doing? He was paying for our filthy sin. He, he who knew no sin. He who knew no sin is paying it for me and for you. We've got to have a fresh revelation the cost and the suffering of Christ. I believe we also need to have a revelation of the power that raised Christ from the dead. The power that raised Christ from the dead. What an amazing thing. Christ being raised from the dead right 
in the pit of the enemy, right in the enemy's domain, right there where he was king devil, small k. Where he, with all his tribe and goodness knows what and everything that was going on there and the pomp and the ceremony, in the midst of all that, the power of God that surged into that body and caused it to rise again, amen, right in the very pit and the power that was invested in Jesus that day as he stood and he took on the whole demonic realm. Satan, every hood, every demonic force, every force, everything that would ever come against you, that would ever try to pull you down, every bit of discouragement, every bit of negativity, every, everything that the devil ever had, he stood in the midst and he took them on. Hallelujah. Today we looked at one of those boys that were playing for the Broncos and he took them on. <laughs> and he just went through. You see, if you don't, if you don't, and I'm sorry using this, this thing, this term, but, but see, he, he could have just sat back and think, man, they're big. Or he could have sat back and said, that's important. No, he, oh, man, I like the look on his face. He, he look at, his eyes opened up and he said, there's a hole there and I'm going through it. And there were people there that tried to stop him, and he just pushed them aside, and he went through there, and he put that ball down, and then he stood up there, and he threw that ball in the air. Shakabundi, eh? You see, that's the, we're the church. We don't, we don't do that. We, 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 we've got that verse of Scripture that says, turn the other cheek. We do this, we do that, I don't know, but we've got to have a fresh revelation of, of what the power that raised Christ from the dead. We've also got to have a fresh revelation of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The infilling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. That speaks to me, living water I don't know about you, but if you look anywhere from above from the aeroplane and you'll see a strip of green, I want to guarantee you that's where the river is. The river brings life. The river brings life. Amen. And out of your innermost being is life, is life. And as you start to speak in the Spirit, and as that life starts to build up inside of you, and then you go out and you start to speak to people, you'll bring life. The church is not meant to be some dormant thing. It's meant to... It's meant to be. It's more than tongues. Amen? He didn't say you shall receive tongues when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. He said you shall receive power. Tongues is an evidence. Tongues really is an evidence. That's for sure. I thank God that I speak in tongues. There's a lot of times I don't know what to say. Speaking in tongues is an amazing thing. I, I, I say I don't know how we'd ever last in a prayer meeting if you couldn't speak in tongues. Amen. Speak in tongues. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all. But it's not just tongues. It's power. Fresh revelation of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You see, when a Christian loses these fundamental truths that I've just shared, all we have is religion. Religion. That's all we've got is religion. The result of religion is emptiness. Emptiness. I don't know, you would know too, friend, and this is, I believe, one of the greatest proofs that people, when they start to dry up, when they start to not push through, when they, when they stop allowing the presence of God. I, I went to the barber, obviously, the other day. <laughs> Had my ears lowered. Sitting in the chair there, starting and talking to him and just listening and sharing and 
Roman would be proud of me. I asked him if he's had any spiritual, whatever it was, that how you kick him off. And he said, yes. He said, I was a Christian. I, I, got, I used to go to church. And I don't know how many times I've heard, I used to go to church. See, I, I went to the chook house the other day at my son's house, and I walked in there and I didn't become a rooster. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Receiving what God has and the, and the infilling of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and, and, and edifying yourself and building yourself up in the most holy faith and, and, and getting stirred up. Shakabundi, I'm getting stirred up as I'm talking. I can, I can feel it coming on and shakabundi to keep it under and you're talking and all of a sudden things of this world grow strangely dim and all of a sudden revelation knowledge starts coming in and the power of God starts talking to you. And, and all of a sudden the things that, that all of us were, were, were sort of coming heavy upon you, they're gone. Because you see, that's, that's what Christianity is. It is not a religion. It's reality. It's serving a risen Christ. It's serving a risen Savior. When the fundamental truths go, all we've got is religion, which results in emptiness. But friend, we've got to behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. One of the great, I think, awakenings, God's outpouring is not so we can build big churches. It's to glorify Jesus. You see, the Bible says this. It says, seek first the kingdom of God. I believe in big churches. I, I believe in massive churches. I long to see the, you know, when there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands. I'm longing to see the day that we can walk into the stadium, a football stadium with thousands upon thousands of people worshipping God. I believe in that. But the main focus is to glorify Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You see, I believe that what God wants to do is bring revelation to us. How many people know that there's a move of God going to take place? Well, we recognize it. You see, let me go back. When Jesus opened up that book, he, he, he had had an amazing encounter with God. His countenance would have, would have I, I, I can't explain it, but it, it, he's had an amazing encounter with God. God has filled him with the power. God has anointed him like he's never been anointed before. He walks into that room. Obviously, people would have noticed something different. When I got saved, people noticed a difference on my life. You see, when you have an encounter with God, there's a difference. It makes a difference, amen. And so, as he walks in there, and as he opens up the book, I would say this, that 90% of the people in that building, it went right over their head because they didn't recognize the move of God. If we don't allow ourselves to get caught up in the realm of the Spirit, and I'm not talking about being stupid, but I'm just talking about being real, we will miss the next move of God. It because it may not come the way you want it. When Jesus came, the Jewish people missed it because it, he didn't come the way they thought he would come. I remember in 93 when we had an outpouring of the Spirit of God 
And I was in New Zealand, and God was pouring out His Spirit, and people were falling out off their, off their chairs in the meeting, just slipping off their chair, falling on the floor, rolling, laughing. And I remember this lady. She had a beautiful hat on. She was dressed beautifully. She stood up and she said, uh, this is not the way I want it. I don't want this kind of church. So she walks out of the church and she went out to everybody's knowledge to go home. About an hour or so later, might have been two hours later, when church was over, the lady that got up and walked out was rolling around in the car park, <laughs> laughing her head off, hat gone, dress all. I reckon it's better to give up early. <laughs> You remember that lady in the end? You remember that time? Yes, you remember that. So I'm not telling you fibs. Will we recognize the next move of God that's going to get ushered in by the mighty Holy Ghost? Or will we not see it?